Okay, let's discuss some more stuff about third parties today. But just before we get to that, I want to say something real quick. Uh, if there's any, you know, uh, anyone out there, family of military, uh, you know, and you've got, you know, a veteran in your family or someone that, you know, has fallen in the line of duty, I just want to, you know, say to everyone, happy Memorial Day. And I think it's important that on a day like this, we remember, you know, Veterans Day is more or less for, you know, the, our living veterans. Memorial Day is for those who've fallen in the line of duty and never made it back home. And as much as you hear me talk about on this channel about getting out of the wars, I think some people, you know, need, need to remember, okay, it's not the service men and women who advocated to go to these wars. Their country called. You know, we can have our disagreements on whether or not the country should have called. But the country called, they went, made that ultimate sacrifice, and didn't come back home. And that's not the troops' fault. That's our government's fault, which is something we're going to be focusing on again today. So I think every, you know, I think it's good that we do recognize that and still pay honor and tribute to those fallen warriors. Okay. But that being said, as I said, back to the third party stuff. So I'm going to start, you know, since I'm an independent, start talking a lot more about this third party uh, concept. And me, uh, David Spurrier, and uh, Franco uh, of Frank Analysis, we all had a pretty good conversation, I believe, on this this past Saturday already. Okay. But it's not enough. We need to keep talking about it. Now, I stumbled across a video uh, last night that my mother-in-law told me about. I had not seen this video at any point in time. And that's surprising considering I follow this stuff a lot more. And she really doesn't follow politics that much. Now, I don't know if any of my viewers have seen this video. I'm not sure if anyone has seen it yet or not. But I don't recall hearing very much conversation take place about the video. And so because of that, we're going to take a look at that real quick. And then we'll discuss what was stated within the video. I'm not going to play the entire thing. The entire video is about 10 minutes long. So I'm going to take a snippet of it. But I will be posting a link to the video in the description below if you want to go watch the entire thing. And I do highly recommend it because it is a very interesting, informative video. So nonetheless, let's take a quick look at it and we'll come back. If you look at American politics and think everything is fine, this video is not for you. To the rest of us, things seem pretty broken. I mean, our forefathers created a beautiful system and we live in a magical country. How the hell did things get so bad? These days, just 2% of Americans trust that our elections work how they're supposed to. Congress has an approval rating of 20%. Our leaders are locked in partisan warfare and they aren't fixing anything. And we're angry. We're angry at the system, at each other. Our country is getting poorer, sicker, more divided, and our families are paying the price. We don't even talk to each other anymore. America's political system has been hijacked to ensure those with power keep it. And for the rest of us, well, it's not so good. I'm going to show you exactly how today's political system is creating the problem. Exactly how we fix it and how the solution ultimately depends on you. This Venn diagram shows the relationship between an elected official doing what the people want and their likelihood of getting re-elected. Ideally, they'd serve the people and have a high likelihood of re-election. But a recent Harvard Business School report by Professor Michael Porter and Catherine Gale show that the relationship looks more like this. They found virtually no correlation between serving the will of the people and getting reelected. In other words, if our elected leaders do their jobs, they're more likely to lose their jobs. How is that possible? The report blames it on two privately held gain-seeking organizations, America's two major political parties. 
In 2019, both major parties publicly threatened to blacklist candidates and contractors who veered from the party lines. They control the money, the debates, the primaries. They even draw their own voting districts. A full 61% of Americans want another option. But any third party or independent who runs is seen as a spoiler. So year after year, we choose between the lesser of two evils, Democrats, Republicans, Republicans, Democrats. In, in any other environment, a new competitor would swoop in to better serve their constituency. You hate your cable company? Here comes streaming. But the two parties have rigged the system to block competition. But it gets worse. In 86% of House races, we now know which party will win the general election before it even starts. That means all of the competition is in the primaries, where as few as 14% of voters participate. And primary voters tend to be more partisan than those who vote in the general election. So the most partisan candidates win the primary, they're virtually guaranteed to win the general, so you can guess what happens next. Over time, the parties move further and further apart. This graphic shows members of Congress who worked with the other party to pass a law in 1953. The gray lines represent their collaboration. The more lines you see, the more times they crossed party lines to pass a law. This is how it looked in 67. Uh, in 81. Look what happened in 1995. And by 2011, it represents where we are today. Hardliners are rewarded. Collaboration is vilified. Congress is so gridlocked, they can't even pass the most basic laws to improve the lives of everyday Americans. For the first time since the Great Depression, life expectancy in the U.S. is actually going down while it goes up in the rest of the world. We were once ranked top in the world for education. We fall into 27th. We can't afford life-saving prescriptions and medical bills are forcing families into bankruptcy. Almost half of American families can't even afford basic necessities like rent and food. What I want to know is, how do we fix it? Now, if you got interested in that video and you want to see what they say about fixing it, uh, again, go down into the description and click on the link and watch the rest of the video. Again, highly recommend it. Now, I'll go ahead and talk about a little bit of what they said. Uh, the solution is in just a minute. But before we get to that, let's talk about what we just heard and break that down. So, what you just saw is that the way things are set up right now, the politicians who do the bidding of the people are more likely to not get reelected than the politicians who don't do the bidding of the people. Now, why is that? That, that would obviously be because you've got mega wealthy donors in play. And what these big corporations and wealthy interests don't want is what's good for the rest of the people. Because not everyone's a wealthy millionaire or billionaire. Not everyone owns a Fortune 500 company. Not everyone is a DOD contractor. Not everyone is tied up in Wall Street. Okay? So what they want benefits their elite kind. Doesn't benefit the guy out busting his ass to make ends meet and make a living. And so what happens is they're taking politics and turning it into the swamp. That swamp you heard Donald Trump talk about, right? Okay. So if you do the bidding of the people, then the wealthy interests come along and says, Hey, buddy, look, we don't like you. Why? Because you don't kiss our ass the way all these other folks do. And so, as a result of that, mm, well, we're going to put someone up against you. We're going to try to primary you. And we're going to make sure that they get the funding, okay, to really try to take you on and smear you, run your name into the mud. We'll hire every investigator potentially possible to dig up dirt on you. And if we find it, 
we'll embarrass you and we'll make you look horrible. So here's your options, man. Either you're going to learn to play by our rules or you're going to be old news because we're going to get rid of you. Tell me for a moment what that almost sounds like. That almost sounds like a, a mob. That almost sounds like the kind of things you would hear uh, from an organized crime movie. Sounds like something you could have, uh, have heard on The Irishman. That sounds like the mafia basically talking. Hey, you're either going to do what we tell you to do, or you're going to be out. Seriously. <laughs> so, let that sink in. You've got people acting like organized crime mob bosses controlling your political system. Now, okay, obviously when he talks about, you know, life expectancy starting to go down, of course, because, again, our prescription medication costs an astronomical amount. That's the private market gone wild, okay, and we can't get something like, I don't know, healthcare in place like the rest of the developed world has. We've got a crappy healthcare system. Gee, I wonder why things are going downhill for the country in, that, in these areas, okay? It's not really hard for me to figure out. Now, on their solutions, the main solution that they give is about passing a American Anti-Corruption Act. Now, what they bring up is that you can't necessarily just expect Congress or the Senate to pass these sorts of things. Because you've got the corrupt people already in power. How are you going to get them to pass legislation like this? That's like asking the fox to guard the hen house. That's not going to work. So what they advocate for is they say, if you go back and you look at changes that have occurred over time in the country, you know, a uh, gay marriage, interracial marriage, they go through all these different things. How did that get started? Because laws started being passed at the state level. And states control elections. And it's not just state elections. It plays a hand in federal elections. For example, I forget the exact state, but I know there is one up in the Northeast that uses already, if I'm not mistaken, a ranked choice voting system. I, I, I remember reading about that. And I don't want to misspeak. I, I think maybe Hampshire, but it might not be. Either way, there's a ranked choice voting already in place. So if we can affect that, where does this start to sound familiar? Sounds like something I've been saying over the last week, especially. Maybe it's time we take a different approach to this. Maybe it's time that instead of we think that the one step to make and the only step to make that's going to solve our entire problem is winning a presidency. Because it's not. We don't live in a kingdom. We don't live in a, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, ruled kingdom where the king is in uh, charge of everything. And the president has checks and balances system. And even though you can argue that's been abused in recent years, they're not going to let an outsider abuse it. They'll impeach his ass or her ass, whoever it is. They'll put him out. And you best believe They'll get the votes to do it because the Democrats and the Republicans will team up. You will finally see real bipartisanship if something like that were to happen. Mark my words. Okay? So, start at the state level. And what they advocate for is, number one, it includes term limits, reasonable term limits. Wow! Now, that alone might make a big difference. But reasonable term limits... A $100 tax credit where you can donate to your candidate that you like for elections, okay? Now, what they're not clear about is, is that just president, is that Senate, is that Congress, or do you get to take a $100 tax credit for each position? That wasn't specified. But 
tell you the truth, either way, I think it'd be okay. Okay? It, you know, as long as we're not, like, able to do it for, I don't know, the dog catcher or whatever. You know, that, you know but, but, but important positions um, at the, when you're voting for the federal level or even state level or whatever, however they want to break this down, state level, maybe you can claim it on your state taxes, federal, you claim it on your federal taxes and you get that money. Okay? So that's something that could be debated. But the $100 tax credit that you can put towards your candidates, okay? Now, I know I've said in the past that I would much prefer, you know, equal time being given out where, you know, it's not necessarily a money game in the first place. And I would still like to see that, but I also see that could be a bit of a problem. So again, I'm not completely opposed to this concept. But the main thing that it also puts in there is that no lobbyist can contribute to these campaigns. So lobbyists, gone. Something else we need to make sure is that super PACs are gone, okay? Corporations should not be allowed to contribute money. So certainly individual rich folk could donate up to a certain amount, but all this money that can be pumped in in the, in the dark of night that never really comes out in the light, no, get rid of it, take it away. And if we start passing this at state levels, there could be something that catches on where it gets into the federal, you know, view of things. Another thing they bring up is obviously instituting rank choice voting because that creates that open window for independents to really have a chance, especially on the federal level, especially on the presidency. Okay? In your own state, you're not having to compete with other entities out there. So winning Senate or Congress would be one thing. Winning the presidency is an entirely different ballgame. Now, again, I've made my case. I know I might not necessarily be with a lot of the people in the country. I do think the Electoral College serves a purpose because if it doesn't, people like me would be never heard from on the president you know, election again. They would focus on New York, California, and a handful of others, and we would be forgotten news around here. Okay? So I do think that it has its, you know, place to give everyone that, you know, that, that, that vote. Okay? But because you've got all these other states out there, that's where they can really throw that narrative at you that you're the spoiler. You're, you're, you're just spoiling everything. And that you're going to hand the election over. Ranked choice voting, you can say, okay, well, this is my first pick. And if I had to pick between one of these two jackasses, I guess I would take this guy. So you can do things like that, okay? So ranked choice voting all the way. And so what they eventually kind of bring around is that if you start instituting this stuff at the state level, it catches on at the federal level, and then you can start to get these changes. But again, what they're advocating for is starting down here and that's something that i said last week i said I've, I've really doubled down this mentality before we aim for the top position in the country perhaps we should focus on more local positions perhaps it calls we need to institute new state government perhaps we need to replace that senator in your backyard with some other candidate and so my challenge is for these third parties whether it be Libertarian, whether it be Green Party, whether it be a People's Party, if they get the wheels rolling and they're ready by 2022, whomever it is, if you're really serious about this, stop just throwing me a presidential candidate. Why don't you give some candidates in these states? Now, I understand there's a money issue there. I understand that you've got things where they're trying to keep you off the ballots, like in Texas, and that does create a problem. And so that's where people who are sick and tired of the two-party dictatorship are really going to have to get out and go out to the streets and do something. They're going to have to make their voices heard. They're going to say, no, we want another option. And put it out there. Put it out there. As long as you keep voting for the problem or just sit at home and do nothing and allow them to keep being the two forced candidates every single time, a Democrat and a Republican, nothing's going to change. If you do nothing, you can be certain of one thing. Nothing's going to change. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And so, if we start taking Senate, congressional seats, 
we start chipping away at the infrastructure on the bottom and sooner or later that two-party dictatorship is going to lose cornerstones when they start losing cornerstones it's hard for them to stay upright when they don't have a big portion of their bottom base to hold their current system in place. Regardless of whether the Democrats or the Republicans control the House or the Senate, it doesn't really matter. They're serving their corporate interests at the end of the day anyway. And so if you start taking away some of those numbers, then it might not be able to renew the Patriot Act. They might not be able to renew all these different things. And then they got a problem on their hands. A big problem on their hands. Likewise, if we get some of these folks instituted, they can start advocating for some of this legislation like we just talked about. Some of this anti-corruption stuff. Term limits. okay, Getting big money out of elections. They can start advocating for this stuff. And if the Democrats and the Republicans don't vote for it, then they, our independent folks get, get elected can go out and hold press conferences and say... Uh, just so you American people know, we're trying to get this stuff done and they don't want to vote for it. And then you can best bet these are things that are polling very high with the American people getting that corruption out because they're tired of that system. We might disagree on all these other issues, but there's one thing about it. It doesn't matter if you're right or left. We can agree we're tired of the corrupt government. A lot of people are. Doesn't matter if you're an Obama supporter, a Bush supporter, Trump supporter, Biden supporter. A lot of people are tired of a corrupt government. You go out there and you make the case, hey, we're trying to do this and they're stopping us. And a lot of people are going to start going, really? And then they might start to consider, huh, wonder if I should vote for this guy. And if you start winning seats and you start getting noticed, other people, even if you don't win the first time or two around, might start to notice and say, hmm. So maybe we should try this party over here. It seems like they're actually trying to do something and these two guys aren't doing a damn thing. Some people might say, well, why aren't you doing that now? Because the proper steps haven't been taken. For one, these third party candidates seem to really focus more about the presidency than they do a lot of these other positions. And I think that's to their own peril. You don't build from the top down. You build from the bottom up. Okay? That's how this has got to work. I mean, it would be great to get the presidency, but again, what's he going to accomplish if he has to deal with the swamp and none of them want to vote for his legislation? You've got to start chipping away at the House and the Senate. And I think this video does a great job of explaining the problem. Again, I encourage you to go watch the rest of the video, listen to the solution. I think they do a really good job of breaking this down.